Thank you so much. Uh, I, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be standing here um, and to have gotten the call uh, that I was uh, going to be the Schaefer Lecturer uh, and to actually be here right now uh, speaking with you. I am going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that I've done, but first um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, some of the people who uh, came before me. And specifically, uh, of course, Dr. Schaefer, um, who is one of the giants of glaucoma uh, and also uh, was a giant as an individual. Um, and the first Schaefer lecturer uh, in 1980 uh, was Bernard Becker, uh, who uh, unfortunately we've just lost this year. The second Schaefer lecturer was Morton Grant. And Dr. Grant uh, was uh, one of my mentors in training. Um, he uh, was a fantastic man, as, as you've heard from Dr. Ewok. Um, I had the privilege of co-authoring Toxicology of the Eye uh, with Dr. Grant. Um, in preparing today's Schaefer lecture, um, I, I couldn't help but think about the lecture that Dr. Grant delivered uh, as the Schaefer lecturer, um, which was, why do some people go blind from glaucoma? And that seminal talk, which turned into a seminal paper in ophthalmology in 1982, um, is one of the uh, prime papers that I ask all of my residents to read before they start the glaucoma service. And that paper presaged the many other studies that you heard about during the last session, actually, in terms of um, controlled prospective trials to show that treatment for glaucoma actually has an effect, and at what level do we need to treat patients when they have a certain degree of disease. Now, you may ask, what does this person have to do with this one? Well. The, sec the second one I showed you was Isaac Newton, and he said, if I have seen further, it's because uh, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I am no Isaac Newton, uh, but I do get to stand with giants. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the people in my laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh, um, who are a fantastic group of people who I am privileged to have the chance to work with, and also uh, our collaborators throughout the world. So over the years, uh, and even in the last session, we've heard that functional change follows structural change. And uh, perhaps one of the first uh, reports of this was from Al Summer. Uh, and he uh, wrote that the retinal nerve fiber layer loss may precede Goldman visual field defects by as much as five years. And in his study, uh, it was an average of 1.5 years. Um, and he said nerve fiber layer assessment by means of fundus photographs may be the earliest, surest means of distinguishing ocular hypertension from true glaucoma. And many of us took that to mean structural change precedes functional change. And in the setting in which Dr. Summer reported this, this is clearly uh, true. And there have been a number of different studies since that time that show that you have to lose a fair amount of neural tissue before you get a visual field abnormality. And that, uh, in fact, uh, that it's not until you lose as much as 40 or 50 percent of the optic nerve tissue that uh, you have a Goldman visual field abnormality, maybe 30% for automated perimetry. And using OCT, we found that it was about 20% of the uh, nerve fiber layer that had to be lost before a visual field defect with automated perimetry is detectable. Um, less needs to be lost in order to uh, detect a short wavelength automated perimetry defect. But is it true that structural change precedes functional change always? 
Well, we heard uh, the reports from Harworth's paper from Felipe Medeiros uh, and uh, from others who um, showed that, in fact, the change can be coincident between the loss of retinal ganglion cells and the loss of visual function. And we know that SWAP shows earlier changes than are detectable by uh, standard achromatic perimetry. Um, and it, we also know that even in very early glaucoma, people report a reduced quality of life, as we heard from Jack Chaffee. So there must be something that we're missing, maybe as an artifact of how we measure visual function in glaucoma. In patients with visual field defects, there's almost always a corresponding abnormality in the optic nerve or the nerve fiber layer that we can detect. In fact, if I see a visual field defect and can't see a detectable abnormality in the optic nerve or in the nerve fiber layer, I start to wonder if that visual field defect is real. And if it is real, then is it really from glaucoma? So our hypothesis going into the study that I'm about to report to you is that structure and function actually change at the same time. And that current technology limits our ability to detect functional abnormalities and change early in glaucoma. And similarly, it's difficult to measure structural change late in the disease. As you heard from Don Budenz, there's a floor effect in the retinal nerve fiber layer measurements that we make with OCT. And in the region where both structure and function are changing, that they change at similar times. We had uh, published a paper, it was in print last year, it was uh, e-published the year before, um, that we call the tipping point. And we called it the tipping point because there is a point at which the structure-function relationship becomes uh, very close, whereas prior to that point, the structure-function relationship is quite poor. So in this range, where you have retinal nerve fiber layer that is either thicker or thinner, there's essentially no visual field loss. But when you cross this point, the tipping point, the relationship becomes very close, and each change in RNFL thickness, or each difference in RNFL thickness, yields a different level of functional loss. Well, uh, this was cross-sectional data. So we've seen this curve many times, uh, and even today. Uh, I'd like to dissect it a little bit. So what I'm saying is that in this portion of the curve that there is measurable change in structure primarily, not so much in function. In this portion of the curve, you have measurable change in both. And then in this portion of the curve, you have primarily measurable change in function. And the tipping point is where you go from having a poor relationship between structure and function to a strong relationship between the two. But once again, all of these claims were based on cross-sectional data, and we now have longitudinal data to examine this relationship. So we have uh, studied 127 subjects, 220 eyes, and it varies how many eyes were included in each portion by parameter. Um, the baseline age, as you can see, was 62 with a range from 25 to 85, 40% male. And the mean follow-up was 10 years. Median was 9.6. And the range was from 1 to 17 years. And 149 eyes were uh, glaucomatous, 48 were glaucoma suspect, and 23 were healthy. There were 10. Uh, mean, uh, there was a mean of 10 usable visual field uh, visits, uh, median was 9, the mean number of OCT visits was 10, uh, and the baseline RNFL in the cirrus units um, was 88, and the baseline mean deviation was uh, 
two, minus 2.38. Now, we had a problem because the technology that we started with was not the technology that we ended with. And for visual fields it was, but for OCTs it was not. And we started with our prototype OCT device back in 1994, and we proceeded along the OCT12 commercial unit, the OCT3 commercial unit, to the spectral domain OCT, which became available in 2006. So we had to develop a way of making these devices compatible with each other. And what we did was to create calibration equations that would allow us to use all of the data that we had acquired. And calibration removes systematic differences, um, but it does not remove uh, random differences. So in order to compare this, in order to compare the devices in terms of imprecision, um, we needed to simultaneously adjust for scale differences. Um, and we found that the, prototype, the measurements that were made with the prototype OCT, not surprisingly, had the most variability, the highest imprecision, as compared to spectral domain OCT, which had the least variability. So here you can see pairs of plots between prototype and OCT12, OCT12 and Stratus, and Stratus and Cirrus. And these are the lines of equality. And if you want to jot these down, uh, this would be a good time. These are the calibration equations that we used uh, in this uh, study. I hope you all got that. Um, now, these are the data. So these are the, the plots for every individual in this study. Um, and what you're seeing here is longitudinal data that show um, the relationship between mean deviation function and OCT-based RNFL thickness structure. And you can see how there is, once again, this tipping point, and that that tipping point occurs at close to where we found it on the cross-sectional data. So I'll show you a few cases, and then I want to show you a different way of analyzing the data. Uh, the first case is somebody who is stable over time. So this is a patient who was stable over 17 years, and you see the visual field on the right and the series of OCTs, and on the top is a plot of the visual field index. On the bottom is the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness over time. So you can see that in this person over 17 years, there's really no change that occurs. Now this person has a change in structure, but not in function. And what we see is that the retinal nerve fiber layer is becoming thinner, but it's not until it gets to a certain point of, uh, of thickness where you start to see visual field loss. Here is another patient who has a change in structure, and then once you reach the tipping point, a change in function. And so you're following this patient over time, and there is thinning occurring in the, uh, in the OCT. The visual field is very variable, but you can see that there's no change that sticks until the RNFL becomes thin enough where you start to have visual field loss. This is a patient who changes in both structure and function. And what I want you to pay attention to is first the red curves. So the red curves are one eye, and you can see that the person has visual field loss, the person is already below the tipping point, uh, and that, that visual field loss and OCT thinning occur. But I also want you to look at these blue lines because here you see a reduction in the VFI, but the OCT is stable. And the OCT is stable because you've already reached the floor uh, for that eye. Here is somebody who's changing primarily by function. So as the nerve fiber layer thickness reaches the measurement floor, you stop having change in the nerve fiber layer, but you continue to have deterioration of the visual field. 
Okay, here's another way of looking at the same data. And th this um, I found to be intuitive. What I'm gonna talk about is something called states and the transitions between states. And so let's say that you have a visual field index here and RNFL thickness here. So here would be a thick RNFL and a good visual field. Um, the, the eye can change from being in this state to this state, which would be functional loss. Or it can change from this state to this state, which would be structural loss. Or there can be both structural and functional loss. In this analysis, there can be any of these changes in states. What cannot happen are these changes in states in this analysis. So these are not allowed. Once somebody changes to have loss, they can't go back. Let me uh, show you this maybe a little bit more clearly. Here, uh, the patient is starting out with this RNFL thickness, and this is at time one. At time two, the same thickness. Now they're going down. They went back up, but they can't change state. Now they went down again. Went back up, but they can't change state. Now, this is the actual distribution of the patients in our study in terms of state changes. And here we have a patient with a certain RNFL thickness and a certain BFI. And you can see what happens over time. The person started with a thick RNFL, and what you have is loss of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness without loss of function. Here you have a patient who developed functional loss, and the RNFL measurements are stable. You can see that they're fairly thin, and you have a change in the function of the patient. And here you have changes in both. So this is the actual 2D progression map, as I said, and I'll try to illustrate what's going on in another way. The broader bars represent more individuals, and so you can see that in people who have thick retinal nerve fiber layer, that in fact the change is generally only in structure, only in retinal nerve fiber layer. In people who have thinner retinal nerve fiber layer, the change is primarily in function. You do have people who have changes in function, certainly in that mid-range as well. And then in, in people in the middle, you have changes primarily in both. We can also predict what the change in state will be over time. So what you're seeing is a state change map over a 10-year period showing you from what state a person is to where they're likely to end up. And in fact, in this case, it's not where they're likely to end up, it's actually where they did end up. So to summarize, we've now developed longitudinal data that validate the structure-function relationship and the concept of the tipping point. Structure and function seem to change simultaneously past the tipping point and above the floor and that regions of disconnect are likely an artifact of how we measure structure and function. Structure generally changes without changes in visual field early in glaucoma. Once the tipping point is passed, both structure and function change, and after the RNFL measurement floor is reached, changes are primarily in visual fields. Future outcome of patients at various stages of disease may be predicted based on long-term longitudinal data analyzed using the state change approach. Thank you very much.